Good afternoon. Appreciate everybody hanging in there. I'm sometimes known for going long, so I got myself on a timer. I probably hardly anybody in this room knows I'm an Auburn grad, 1995 War Eagle. I this is actually my first official visit back since then. Uh, I was pretty impressed. I wasn't far into the Alabama on Highway 78, and I had an escort. Except usually the escort's supposed to be in front of you, and this time the blue lights were behind me. <laughs> I was going 75 and a 70. Usually you're going to get that grace, aren't you? Especially if you're driving a state truck. Not this guy. He asked me what my hurry was. Uh, told him I was going triumphant return back to Auburn, going to give a talk, ag talk. It's okay. Just wrote me a ticket. I'm thinking he's an Alabama fan. <laughs> he probably uh, probably wanted some tree poison or something from me. But <laughs> anyhow, I'm glad to be back. I'm going to talk about sugarcane aphid and sugarcane beetles, and I'm not going to talk much about sugarcane at all. Uh, these pests are pretty major pests, one we've had for a long time. It's a native pest. That's a sugarcane beetle. And the sugarcane aphid, which is a new pest. I want to acknowledge uh, some of the people listed on the bottom of this uh, presentation, um, uh, some of my colleagues in the Mid-South, because they provided a lot of the data, in some cases some of the slides already ready, ready made for me. I'm going to start off with talking about sugarcane beetle and corn. Uh, this one's a little simpler to talk about since it's not new. Uh, sugarcane beetle is native actually to the southeast, uh, pretty much Tennessee, a little higher in Tennessee down there. You can see the distribution. It's kind of unusual. It's, you know, it's a scarab. It's a, like a June beetle. It's like a Japanese beetle. They're all scarabs. Uh, unlike a lot of these beetles, these scarabs that we're used to dealing with, it isn't the white grub that causes the problem, it's the adult that causes the problem. And they feed underground on the roots of corn and sometimes other plants. Real quick on the biology of the sugarcane beetle, it's got one generation per year, and that's it. It overwinters as an adult in the soil, primarily in grassy areas, becomes active in the spring. In my area, that's going to be late April, early May. Down here, it's probably going to be more early April. Uh, it's not typically in the field at the time of planting. When you plant a cornfield, it's not necessarily going to be there. It can be there, particularly if there's some grasses in the field that are attractive to the adults when they're overwintering. The eggs are deposited in the soil. It takes almost three full months for those eggs to develop into grubs and then the next generation of the overwintering adults. They do feed underground. They spend most of their time underground. Occasionally they'll get above ground when they're feeding, which maybe gives you a little bit of a chance to, to kill one occasionally. But you'll also know when a flight's going on a lot of times, or at least a big flight, because the adult beetle shows up at lights pretty frequently at night. On the left here, you can see a, a close-up of the adult beetle. It's a pretty good size beetle, uh, a little over a half inch in length. Uh, one thing to look for on those front legs, it's almost got digging-type spatula Feet. We call them fossorial it's because they can dig, which makes sense if you live underground. Also, another thing to look at is kind of these striations on the back, and that will help you separate it from some other uh, June-type beetles that you might see. On the right, you're seeing just some picture, uh, picture of a corn that's been fed on. It's a picture I took some time ago. And you can see that very ragged feeding, usually right there at the crown of the root. And that's not good. Just another picture from Angus Catshot from one of his trials right there, very typical. Sometimes they go in a little bit, sometimes they go halfway through, sometimes they go all the way through. Depends on the size of the corn plant. In, in some cases, obviously, if they're getting on a bigger stalk, it takes more feeding to, to do as much penetration. So one of the things you look for with any soil feeding insect is dead heart. That's an indication of something wrong. By the time you see a plant with dead heart, you essentially have a dead plant. It's not necessarily going to die, but it's not going to produce an ear. The end result is a lot of times you'll see, and that's one of the things I look for when I'm scouting a field, that, that uh, center leaf unfurl and it's dead. Now early on you'll see it start to develop. You see a wilting leaf coming out of the terminal. Get your, get your spade out. Get your pocket knife out. Start digging around. A lot of times you're going to see root damage. It may not be sugarcane beetle damage. Invariably, though, it's, it's almost always going to be underground damage. I never go to the field scouting corn without just a little hand trowel. And you can see the sugarcane beetle stuck up there. So this is just an example, uh, southern part of West Tennessee, Hardeman County, uh, big production field, very typical result of sugarcane beetle. You go out there and you see some healthy plants, you see some plants that look a little bit less than healthy, and then you see just dead and dying plants. This is one of the biggest problems with sugarcane beetle. We're not 
putting a lot of eyes on our field. It's busy time of the year. People are planting everything. We don't have a lot of professional consultants looking at corn. By the time you get to this stage, it's worse than it looks. You have all these dead plants, which you don't realize is probably another 20, 30 percent of the stand is damaged and on its way down. You get, besides just dead plants, you get what I call sublethal symptoms. On the top uh, left, you see leaning and lodging. That's real common. Honestly, most of those plants that are leaning and lodging, they're, they're not going to make an ear. They're pretty far, pretty badly damaged. If you get just a little bit of feeding, they don't penetrate too far. This is a real common symptomology right here where the, the leaves get kind of a streaking, a white streaking, often along the edges, but not always along the edges. I really think that's just nutrient deficiency, and I think what's happening is that that root damage has interfered with the nutrient uptake in parts of that plant. Uh, often these affected plants will be small ears, or very often if the damage is, an, is bad enough, they won't produce an ear. So we're what are we going to do about the sugar cane beetle? It's a sporadic pest. It's difficult to predict. Some areas it's more common than the other. One of the things we can do is consider at planting insecticides, and that's something we routinely recommend. And in fact, go try to find some seed corn that doesn't have an insecticide seed treatment on it. Good luck. This chart is one that's pretty much pulled out of my insect control guide, but really it's fashioned after uh, uh, the efforts of Kathy Flanders and, and uh, I think David Bunton in Georgia kind of first started this effort, where we did a rating of all the various seed treatment options that are out there against all the various common pests. And the, the rows and the columns I have highlighted are just to make one simple point. The standard rate uh, for corn is usually going to be, unless you special order, Poncho 250, or it's going to be Cruiser or PPST. Both of those are thiamethoxam. This one's clothianidin, but the 250 is going to be the standard rates. Those are pretty decent rates. They do okay. But as you start looking across this chart, you see they're not perfect. Those lower rates are not particularly good on sugarcane beetle. Uh, Poncho is a little bit better than, than thiamethoxam. And there's some things in there that they're not good at all on, like cutworms or western corn rootworms. Not a big problem for most of us, but one that's out there. So we can do better potentially with these seed treatments by either going with higher rates or supplementing. This is just to, to make a point I made on the previous slide. This is data from Angus Catchout in Mississippi in 2009. Uh, just he had a natural infestation of sugarcane beetles in, in some of his corn plant plots there at V3, and he took a rating. And this is something we routinely, routinely see. Cruiser 250, Cruiser 500. Cruiser's not very good at controlling sugarcane beetles. The poncho or clothianidin is considerably better, but it's not always great. So do you need more than the 250 rates? Well, the first thing I'll tell you, even if you're not talking about sugar cane beetles, sometimes you need more than the 250 rates. Uh, we've, we've seen that year in and year out. This is an example of a data set in Tennessee from this past year. Now, these results aren't quite statistically significant, but all these treatments had Poncho 250, but when we added uh, Capture or Smart Choice or something to it, we tended to increase yield. And I see this pretty routinely. Probably the most common response I see is a bump with any kind of seed treatment or infro treatment, but they're all about the same. But every once in a while you see that a little bit more adds a little bit more. And this is just another example from a little farther south in Mississippi. Again, Angus catch out in Mississippi. In this case, everything had Poncho 250 included the untreated. Starter fertilizer added a little yield. Capture added a little yield, the both of them added a little bit more. So a good statistical example of where a little bit more insect control mattered. So how good are the seed treatments for sugarcane beetle? I've already alluded to some of this uh, already. Uh, I'm not sure who developed this technique. It may have been Angus, but I think he borrowed it from somebody. But literally we call it the pipe assay technique, where we put these PVC pipes over individual plants and we drop beetles in there. Of course, these plants have different seed treatments or infro treatments, and we evaluate the mortality and plant damage. And that's what I'm going to show you next. This is an example from, again, Angus in, in Mississippi way back in 2008, showing you the number of damaged plants per five plants which were infested. The thing that should jump out at you at this slide is, is again, the, the cruiser was not particularly good. There does tend to be a rate response as you move up to from Poncho 250 to Poncho 500. Not a real clear one. This is an example of one of mine back in 2013. There's your untreated. Uh, 
very similar. Oop, I lost this for some reason. That's just the stats, however. Uh, Cruiser didn't do very well. Uh, Poncho 500 wasn't great. In this test, Poncho 1250 was clearly better, or really any of the seed treatments supplemented with an infuro spray of capture or karate was the best thing in this trial. And again, this is sugarcane beetle damage. Clear indications that the 250 rates, particularly thiamethoxam or Cruiser, are, are not particularly good at sugarcane beetle. But again, 250, Poncho 250 isn't always going to get it done. Great data set I borrowed from uh, Dennis Reginelli from Mississippi State. He's a county agent there where he did a large uh, field strip trial in the Black Hills of, of Mississippi where they have commonly sugarcane beetle infestations. Everything on this slide had Poncho 250, but he increased yields because of the sugarcane beetle by adding any of these treatments to it, whether it was counter, lowers ban, Aztec, or force. And if you still don't believe me that Poncho 250 may not be good enough, this is just another example, Ron. This is Lauderdale County, uh, Tennessee, back in 2013. This field was probably about 400 acres in size, if you considered the one across the road, and it was pretty much a total loss. I couldn't convince the guy to replant it, but I talked to him later, and he wished he'd replanted it with something else. Bad situation here. If you look in that field, what do you see? bunch of grass growing in there. You know what that is? This was a Bermuda grass pasture the year before. This is ringing the dinner bell for sugarcane beetles. They love that environment. So we do know some things. So here's my general corn recommendations. This is general for everybody. I said at planting insecticides are a must, whether it's a seed treatment or putting something down in the furrow, whether it's a liquid or a spray. And with most of our seed treatments, we don't expect much cutworm control. So if we have a lot of green vegetation in the field, uh, up within two, three weeks of planting, we're typically going to recommend a pyrethroid or something like that, or a pyrethroid for cutworm control. The base insecticide seed treatment rates, those 250 rates are pretty good, but they're not always good enough. So I, I tell my guys in Tennessee, and it may be even more true here, that 250 is okay, but if you have some risk factors, you really need to consider jumping up to the 500 or even the 1250 rates, depending on those factors, or supplementing with some kind of inferro treatment. Number one risk factor, any new production field. Take something out of pasture, take it out of CRP, you got to go. I would specifically probably try to go with a Poncho 250. Uh, if I was using uh, excuse me, 1250. If I was using Poncho 250 or Cruiser 250, I would definitely supplement with an infuro spray or a granular. That's a very high risk uh, situation. Sugarcane beetle history. They're sporadic by nature, but we have some areas of the state in Tennessee, and I'm sure you do here, that get them more routinely than others. If you're one of those areas, uh, I'd be more inclined to go with at least the 500 rate. And if you're in a sugarcane beetle area, you need to think about poncho. Clothianidin is clearly better. 500 or 1250 rates are better than thiamethoxam. If you're going to grow a pioneer variety or another variety that the base treatment's thiamethoxam, then you need to consider supplementing with a infuro granular or a spray. Uh, delayed burn down is another factor. I don't get too excited about just reduced tillage by itself. Uh, I'm really uh, more concerned about the weed control. We want to have a good weed free period before planting. My phone's blowing up here. I think I've covered all the points on this slide. Uh, I'm going to cross over and talk about uh, sugarcane aphids now, the, the second half, and I tried to leave a little bit more time for that since it is a new pest. I can't see my timer. Uh, again, a lot of credit to my colleagues. Probably should have contacted Ron. I know he had some experience kind of like me. Also, You get a lot of experience with this pest uh, all of a sudden. <laughs> as it turned out. It showed up in Tennessee really in August. Early August is when it was first detected. It was pretty obvious in hindsight. It had been present in some areas of the state prior to that. Uh, and somebody asked me, so how many acres of sorghum you got in Tennessee? And I said, well, based on my, four, my uh, phone calls, about uh, 2 million. Because really on us, they just got our late planted sorghum. Couldn't have been five, ten thousand 10,000 acres, but I must have got a call or three calls on every one of those acres. It was, it was pretty impressive. It caught people's attention pretty well. This is a close-up of the, of the critter right there. That is actually a predator, predator feeding on the aphids. But it's a light or yellow-colored aphid, similar to other aphids in size and appearance. Now, we're calling it the sugarcane aphid. To be honest, I'm not 100% sure we got it identified correctly. 
All evidence indicates that it is a sugarcane aphid. It's morphologically very similar to the sugarcane aphid. Um, molecular technique indicates it's sugarcane aphid, but something's different about it. The sugarcane aphid's been around a long time. It's been around actually in Louisiana for I think 10 or 12 years, but it's really never gotten on sorghum in any ex extensive way. So something's changed. Either we've had a host jump from sugarcane to sorghum, or we've had a new biotype somehow be introduced. That's my speculation anyhow, but this slide is actually David Kearns from Louisiana. And I think, obviously, he must have stole it from these guys. So where, where's this thing from? Well, this is prior to the last couple of years, the distribution of the sugarcane aphid worldwide. You can see extensive in South America, parts of Africa, and Southern Asia. Mostly what you see is it's occurring on sugar, sugar cane, but there's cake, uh, plenty of reports on sorghum and also rice, very little bit on maize or, or corn, and then it's not, it previously wasn't present except for in the United States, except for these little pockets right there. So this shows you the current distribution essentially, and I think it's mostly up to date of the sugarcane aphid. Obviously, there's holes in there that could be filled in, but this is where it's been verified. The lighter colored green is, is where it was found in 2013. Uh, 2014 is represented by the dark color green. And I gotta be honest with you, this thing was really a problem down in here and here in 2013, and I said, it's going to be a southern thing, a Louisiana thing. Well, then in 2014, it started marching. And I said, ah, it's not going to get here. Well, then it got pretty close. And then it got about early August, and it was right across the river from Memphis. Scott said he'd better go for a drive. I made it two miles from my office in Jackson, Tennessee. I wasn't even out of the city limits, and it just so happened, the first sorghum field I pulled in, there was a hot spot right there. In fact, it was the only spot in the field, best I could tell, but it was wrapped up. And so Scott had to get busy right in a section 18. <laughs> so what about identifying this critter? Really, there's four common aphids that you might find in sorghum. Well, the one that's most likely to occur in large numbers besides the sugarcane aphid is the corn leaf aphid. I'll show you a picture in a minute, but I don't think you're going to confuse this with the corn leaf aphid because the corn leaf aphid is, is dark green, almost blue in color. The green bug does occur in sorghum, of course. It's a light green with that darker green stripe down it. It doesn't tend to occur in these great big masses. It tends to occur in lower numbers. And the same is true with the yellow sugar cane aphid. It tends to occur in low numbers. You don't usually see great big colonies. Now, if you have a hand lens, to me, these two are probably the most likely to be confused, but with a hand lens, they're not that hard to tell apart because you can see the little hairs on this one and the little bumps. It's really pretty characteristic. So there's a side-by-side -side comparison of an of a infestation of corn leaf aphids and sugarcane aphids. Again, the colors are pretty much a giveaway. These big colonies tend to be yellowish in color. They can be more whitish in color, whereas the corn leaf aphid is going to be green. A little bit about the biology. Like a lot of aphids, this thing has a lot of uh, population growth potential. It reproduces uh, asexually. In fact, there's really no sexual form known. Gives birth to live young, 30 to 60 females, or 30 to 60 females, they're all females, per female. It feeds, like most aphids, on sap or phloem of the plant. It excretes honeydew. Uh, it primarily feeds on the underside of leaves. You will see it on the stems. You will see it occasionally on the tops of leaves. They're, unlike the green bug or the yellow sugar cane aphid, there's no known toxin associated with its feeding. It, there's nothing real acute anyhow. You will see some discoloration on the leaves, and you'll see plenty of pictures of that. Like a lot of aphids also, it seems to do well when it's hot and dry or released dry. And, and it also, there's some anecdotal evidence that it's worse when sorghum populations are a little bit lower. That may be related to being a little drier in those environments. And it also tends to be worse on field edges, so all those things may relate a little bit. But there's clearly edge effects with this insect. Not all the time, but some of the time. So there's some possibility that edge treatments may be in order if you catch infestations early enough. A little bit more. We really don't know about the overwintering of this insect. This is a picture I took in, in Tennessee at the Agri-Center in Memphis. It's not really thought to have an overwintering sexual form, which means it, if that's the case, it's going to freeze back to the coast or the warmer environments every year and then come back up. We don't really know if that's true. 
And the other thing we do know is now it's much more widely distributed across the south, so there's a lot more potential for it to blow up much more quickly. So I think the threat potential is higher than it's ever been, and it was pretty high last year. It will get on grain sorghum. It will get on sweet sorghum, as I mentioned. It will also get on Johnson grass. In fact, that was the first detects I had of it in Tennessee after I found that first field in, of infected, infested sorghum. And it's also difficult to control with insecticides. Uh, you can see it does have a number of beneficial insects that you're all familiar with, lady beetles being very common. But a lot of the lady beetle uh, predators that you've seen on you know, the hoverflies, the the, or the flower flies, the lady beetles, they're all over these things. One thing I have not seen with it is the, a fungal disease like we see with cotton aphid, at least to any extent, and I haven't seen much or any parasitism at all, uh, which is a big difference. Apparently our local parasitoids haven't shifted over to this like they might on, like they do on some of our native species. Just a couple pictures. You're going to see some sticky honeydew on the leaves where you get these hot spots. Very characteristic. You might see very low populations and then just a hot spot where the aphids blew up. Uh, you'll see this on the tops of the leaves, those white things. I just wanted to show that because I bet five times a year somebody asks me what those things are, and it's the shed skins of an aphid. You know, a lot of times you just blow on it, and they'll just blow away. Uh, you can see the leaves are shiny. You can also see lady beetles. And late in the season, uh, when the bees were getting a little hungry for sugar water, they were feeding on the sugar water on the tops of the sorghum leaves. So I do see wasps and bees associated with these things. Uh, if you find that leaf, the one above it's loaded with aphids. <laughs> They've been raining honeydew down on it. So what do they do? This is a great, great picture from a colleague in LSU. Uh, the only difference in these two sides of the fields is one was treated for sugarcane aphid and one wasn't. So obviously we see some stunning and delay caused by this aphid. I got a little video embedded here. This is actually sweet sorghum in, at the Memphis Agri Center. We had several fields in several counties of sweet sorghum that really took it on the chin. They essentially lost them. And part of it is those guys really aren't plugged into the main ag community, so they weren't following some of the updates, and they were caught off guard. Hopefully this thing will play. Or I, th I think somebody else had the previous luck, didn't they? I guess we won't play it. But you can see this on that one point I was going to show on this is they – hit the edge of the field. It just so, hap so happens the edge of the field was also thinner stands. Aphids are pretty much gone at this point. They've crashed, but the, the entire edge of this field was essentially yellow, yellow bronzy, uh, essentially dead. Another good example, a picture from Angus Catshot, pre-boot injury in grain sorghum in Mississippi. So these things can do some Incredible damage. This is just a graph. David Kearns, some of his research at LSU Ag Center, looking at yield and bushels per acre versus number of aphids per, per leaf. And if you start getting above the 100 aphid per leaf number, you start seeing some pretty drastic reductions in yield, 40, 50, 60 percent. And, and you'll see some more data along those lines. Here's another example of some of his, datas, his data. Uh, where he's looking at yield response versus number of aphids. Again, dramatic 50 plus percent yield losses in some cases. So this, this guy's the real deal if it, if it goes unchecked. And this is just a visual verification of that. This is one of the first pictures I saw of this. David Kearns was showing this around after 2013 of a field where an aerial applicator forgot to make the last swath or whatever, and that sorghum and that swath didn't fare so well. One of the big issues you hear about this besides the yield loss and the stunning and, and sometimes plant death is it causes harvest issues. Uh, honeydew and mold uh, may interfere with the glyphosate uptake when you're trying to desiccate it. The, the aphids can clog and the honeydew can clog up combines. I mean, we've had examples even in Tennessee where guys have to make a few passes and then wash off the combine header to get the sticky off of them. Otherwise, their belts get too hot. After you desiccate, these aphids tend to start moving up because they're trying to find something green to feed on, and so that, that makes the problem worse. And this last bullet's from David Kearns also, but he says you can lose as much as 50% of your grain harvest during this time. And, and that is, by the way, all aphids looks like almost dust on that combine header. It's a picture of some sorghum heads in, in Tennessee. I just threw this slide in here to make me make a point because I'd forget it otherwise. The insecticide seed treatments have some value for controlling sugarcane aphids, at least early on. This is data from Mississippi. David Kearns has some very similar, showing you yield and bushels per acre for a, a 
sor uh, sorghum that had an insecticide seed treatment, and I don't know if it was either it was either Poncho or Cruiser, but I don't know which, versus one that did not. So right away with this data, you have some indication that the neonicotinoid insecticides may have some activity. This was one of the first initial test data that I saw came out of Louisiana in 2013. Uh, documenting this insect was not easy to control. Transform provided very good control. Uh, a lot of our, our standard products that are labeled in sorghum, dimethylate, Lorsban, or chlorpyrifos, that's what NUFOS is, not good at all. Intruder, which is good on cotton aphids, has consistently been poor on this aphid. Same with carbine. So we got to be careful not everything uh, kills this insect, and as you'll see later on, some things make it worse. Data from Gus Lorenz, I'm going to throw a lot of these at you pretty quickly, uh, kind of showing the same thing. This is showing you an aphid rating. This is really on a 0 to 3 scale. You'll see this several times. Somebody came up with this. I don't know who it was, but a 0 means there was no aphids. 1 means there was somewhere between 1, to a, one and 100 per flag leaf. 2 means 200 to 300, and then 3 means above 300. So if you get up here, they got a lot of flag leaves, got over 300 aphids per leaf. What didn't do well? Cobalt advance, the untreated check, dimethoate. Interestingly, Lohr's band advance in this test was noticeably better than the cobalt advance, so I don't know if that, that uh, pyrethroid in the cobalt made them worse, that much worse or not. Transform looked pretty good. Indigo, Admire Pro, and again, transform at the higher rate. You look at the yield in this trial. You've got to keep in mind now, sometimes there's other pests involved. But I'm going to make the presumption most of this is due to the sugarcane aphid based on the results here. The untreated check, what, 50 bushel? 140 with Admire Pro. That's a lot of yield loss right there. Admire looked good. Indigo looked good. Transform looked good. Pretty much everything that controlled aphids the best did best on yield. Another example, uh, David Button, University of Georgia. And again, I'm just really trying to hammer home the point that some things work and some things don't. In this case, Transform did very well. Centric did pretty well. Lorsban did pretty well. Not as good as the others, but pretty well. And this is one thing we've seen in some of our data. Uh, and keep in mind, a lot of data is coming out in a hurry. Is Depending on the aphid growth phase, the stage of the sorghum, some treatments look good some of the time, and then they may look miserable the next time. The ones that have been most consistent, Transform's been good, uh, Centric's been good, Admire Pro's been good. Unfortunately, none of those are currently labeled on sorghum. Uh, dimethoate's not been good, Lorsban's not been good, Pyrethroids are less than good, as you can see here. I don't know what happened to all my my cell ranges, but that's just showing you statistics again. But I just make a point. We're looking at several insecticides, some newer products. I'll talk about Savanto later, Transform. Again, this is kind of a relative aphid number. Uh, these things looked good. I mean, dimethoate in this test wasn't terrible. Lorsban wasn't terrible, but that's not enough aphid control. The way these things reproduce, if you leave half the aphids in the field, you're not going to make much headway. Another example from Mississippi, and I think I'll just, it's the same story. It does make the point here, carbine, a good aphid product for a lot of aphids is not particularly good on the sugarcane aphid. Uh, Lorsban in, in this trial here was not very good at all. I'm going to show you several more yield slides uh, just to, again, to pound home some points that this thing is, is the real deal. This is an example from Mississippi where they got a 67% yield loss uh, when they didn't spray sorghum with uh, two applications of transform. This was when the sorghum was infested uh, at the panicle emergence, so right when the head emerged. 67% yield loss. This is at the soft dough stage. This is data Jeff Gore got uh, in the Stoneville area. Even at the soft dough stage, when they infested at that stage, they got up to a 21% yield loss at that time uh, from sugarcane aphid. So what is labeled? For aphid control and sorghum, not much. I've mentioned uh, dimethoate. I don't think anybody's going to recommend it by itself anyhow. It's just not been consistent at all, regardless of the rate. Problem you have with dimethoate and chlorpyrifos is they have long pre-harvest intervals, which really gives you a problem if you got that, that issue at harvest with the aphids on the leaves and heads. That's 28-day pre-harvest interval. Dimethoate's pretty tough on beneficials, so a lot of times what we see with products tough on beneficials is even if they knock them back, the pest comes back pretty quickly. That's what we're seeing with the pyrethroids for sure. 
uh, where Clopyr Foss, Lors Band, New Foss, whatever, Warhawk, whichever one you're using, sometimes looks good. It's tempting. <laughs> it's tempting at times, particularly at the higher rates. Uh, but I'm not confident enough to really go uh, recommend it very often. If I am going to recommend it, it's going to be probably the two pint rate, which means you have a 30 day pH, or excuse me, a 60 day pre harvest interval. So those products really cause some issues with the pre harvest interval. I'll talk about Transform next because it's on the next slide, but uh, it's a little easier to use closer to harvest because it only has a 14 day pre harvest interval. The reasons it's shaded out here is because it's not labeled. It's it's labeled now by Section 18. Actually, it was labeled then by Section 18. 2015, I think you can ex expect that we will also get a, a Section 18 for Transform really anywhere in the south and southeast where this pest occurs. The EPA was good about approving them last year. Uh, several states, it looks like, will submit a Section 18 for Centric. A uh, little bit of debate about whether we should go for Centric or Admire Pro because they appear pretty similar. But we're looking for another mode of action. We're expecting a full label for Savanto. Savanto is a new mode of act in, action from Bayer. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of experience with it. The price appears to be very high, and it may be out of the market. We really don't know how we can, low we can go on the rate to help compensate for that, that high price. I really think uh, at the end of the day, probably the way we're going to solve the sugarcane aphid problem is with resistance hybrid resistance or perhaps uh, genetic resistance, genetically modified resistance. This is just an example of rating that David Kearns took from some of their early uh, germplasm sorghum lines at, at the LSU Egg Center. I'm not sure what station this was at, but you can see there are differences. Uh, uh, there's been some differences reported even among the commercial varieties, and I could have showed you a data slide there. So we know there's some hybrid uh, resistance out there. Uh, we just don't know enough about it. But this is probably going to be more sustainable. Because one of the things, and I didn't have pound this at home that much, but what they found in the more southern environments like Mississippi, Louisiana, in many cases they need three insecticide applications. If you're making three applications of Transform at 10 bucks a shot, with an aerial application, you're talking about a $40 investment minimum. That doesn't make sorghum very sustainable. There's a lot of interest in sorghum this coming year, but that, that is hurting some of the interest right there. So we need to do better than making three insecticide applications, and that is excluding midge applications and excluding applications for headworms. So what would I suggest in 2015? First of all, I would suggest, particularly in the more southern geographies, that you use an insecticide seed treatment. The, the people that seem to have the most experience tell me you can expect 40, 45 days suppression of sugarcane beetle infestations. That's really important because those pre-boot infestations are the most damaging. Those are the ones that will just flat sometimes kill the plant and the heads won't emerge. If aphids are present in the field because they seem to grow so quickly, uh, I've heard my colleague Angus Catch out say we probably need to be scouting twice a week in those circumstances. Not real popular and certainly not what we've been doing with sorghum in most cases. If you don't have sorghum midge, don't spray for sorghum midge. Uh, we can create a problem with these things really quickly by putting out uh, a pyrethroid. And unfortunately, a lot of states, including Tennessee, people are just in the habit of putting a pyrethroid out there for sorghum midge, which really isn't a very common pest in a lot of circumstances. Uh, early planning, I think that's real potential advantage for us in Tennessee. I think as you go further and further south, that gets a little less uh, consistent. But if we're right about the biology that this thing's going to freeze back to the coast areas and move up, certainly early planting might help us avoid the pest. Uh, that's what we saw last year in Tennessee. But again, keep in mind, it had never been in our geography, geography before. Uh, what about action thresholds? When should you treat? This is where we really don't know as much as we'd like to. Uh, take your pick. I've heard people throw out 100 aphids per, on average per flag leaf. Uh, I heard Angus Catchat say 30% infested plants. Not really sure how you determine that. That's kind of a weird, weird way to express a threshold on aphids to me. Uh, I've heard a lot of people, in fact, Angus was the one, and I kind of like this threshold. He said aphids on most plants of the field, and then you've got several spots where you have obvious clusters or colonies, honeydew accumulating in that field. And that seems to work pretty well also. What you don't want to do 
is let these things get very thick. First of all, you'll have already taken loss. Second of all, even with a good product, you don't knock them back far enough and they blow right back up on top of you. I think I have five minutes remaining. Yes, Perfect. I know I went fast. I thought I was going to be long. But uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Maybe, well, there's a couple options come to mind, and some of them haven't been very thoroughly tested. Lorsban will kill Midge. So if aphids are, is in the, are in the field, that, that's an obvious choice. And if there's just a few aphids, you might consider even, you know, pint's plenty <laughs> I mean, to kill the aphids and the midge. Uh, if there's a lot, you might have to go to the higher rate. You're not worried about your 60-day pre-harvest interval. That would probably be the time to me to try it. But I'd be real quick on the follow-up to make sure I got effective control, not of the midge so much, but of the, of the aphid, and they didn't blow up on me. I didn't have any midge this year in my trial, so I, I couldn't tell you what worked. I saw some data from the Mid-South where people were looking at, uh, I'm going blank, Warhawk, the Spinosad product, getting a little bit of control out of it. There was a pretty good uh, effort by some of my colleagues this year to try to find things that are relatively soft on, on the aphids but hard on the midge. So there was a couple of things that were a little bit surprising to me. I didn't think... Uh, would really give much midge control, and the spinosad product was one of them. But I saw some discrepancy in the data. Uh, if you have to go with a pyrethroid, I, I just think you need to be very aware of that. And before you put a pyrethroid out there, I probably wouldn't use a pyrethroid. If there was an aphid in the field, I probably wouldn't use it. If there was an aphid in the next county, I probably wouldn't use a pyrethroid. So I think you need to be really careful with that one. Of course, if you get into the headworm situation, you got the same question. Which product do I use? You know, pyrethroids haven't been as consistent. Anyhow, do I switch over to a belt? Do I switch over to a, a Prevathon-type product that's uh, not going to flare up my aphids? Yeah, they're quite a bit more money, but you're, you're not uh, increasing your risk of, of increasing that aphid population. Kind of takes Besiege out of the picture for me because Besiege is a mix of a pyrethroid plus the same product that's in Prevathon, so it may have those same negative consequences. I don't know, Ron, what do you think on midge control? What else comes to your mind? I don't have a lot of experience with midge control, but I can't think of anything that you have to Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a tough one. So, I mean, and when you have midge, you need to be spraying. It's a very serious pest when you get it. I will say in Tennessee, it's a very relatively uncommon pest, unless you got sorghum, late planted sorghum, in the near vicinity of early planted sorghum. That's one thing I would avoid, a cultural control right there. Don't, don't put late planted sorghum next to earlier planted sorghum. That's when you get it, the worst. Great question. I wish I had a little better answer. Any, any other questions? Ron, how bad was it in Alabama last year? I got two minutes. Wow, we didn't realize we had so many uh, fields. Yeah, same here. <laughs> it, it's, it's pretty impressive. And it basically got all the fields. Not, not north so much, huh? It worked its way up through West Tennessee. Yeah, well, I, I will say in Tennessee, I was kind of proud of, we don't have many consultants looking at it, but I was proud of our retailers. They, they kind of overreacted, but when the word got out, and I'll take some credit for that, they really covered it pretty quickly, which, uh, you know, fortunately, wasn't that many fields. And really what we were worried about was the late planted sorghum. Uh, again, another cultural control, but we had... The worst fields we had were double crop sorghum behind wheat. Uh, that may be something to try to avoid. Air versus ground application and how much water? What kind of control can you get on air versus ground? Yeah, well, you know, I, I've, there's circumstances where aerial application is just as good as ground, but all things being considered, you always want to try to go with the ground application. I'm not a huge volume freak, but when it comes to airplane, I do like to see the volume go a little bit higher. Uh, you know, three's good, five's better. Uh, may consider increasing your rate because there's no question you can get some, you can just lose some volatilization. There's good data set in Mississippi State for years and years, a guy named David, oh my gosh, I'm going to blank on his name, but he'd show, you know, heat of the summer, you're losing 40% of your product a lot of times before it hits the canopy. So you need to consider increasing your rate. 
Uh, there's a lot better applic aerial applicator people than I am. We don't do much aerial application in Tennessee, but I'm going to go with the old standard recommendation, bump up your rate a little bit, bump up your volume a little bit. More water almost never hurts. It doesn't always help. Any other questions? I got 10 seconds left. If not, I appreciate everybody's attention. <laughs>